The final project in our Introduction to Mechatronics class is going to be motion control of a brush DC motor. So just like we had a, an intermediate PID assignment where we controlled the amount of light coming out of an LED that hit a phototransistor, now we're going to be controlling the angle of our brushed DC motor. So what does that mean? We're going to have a uh, reference trajectory computed uh, this time inside of our computer. So in the computer, we're going to say, I want the motor to start at this angle, and I want it to go to this angle and come back. Uh, so this angle at this time, um, and then it will stop and it will hold that position. So the uh, computer will generate that number. And that will go into our uh, PID controller for position. OK, so ooh, sorry about the squeaks. Um, what does that mean? Our PID uh, controller is going to be calculating an error in position. So it must be able to measure um, the actual position of the motor. So we have the uh, reference um, uh, minus the actual position gives us the error. And we can uh, do a derivative and we can do integral. Uh, we can multiply by three different gains. And that will tell us um, how to move the motor so that the uh, actual position will become the reference position. If we wanted, we could make that the PWM. The PWM could go to our H-bridge. The H-bridge would apply a certain voltage to the, the motor. Uh, we would read that motor position with an encoder, and that would be our feedback controller. Um, but it, it doesn't do exactly what we want it to do. It doesn't take into consideration um, the amount of current that's going through the motor, so the torque that the motor is generating to accelerate to get to that position. It doesn't take into consideration the voltage that we're applying. Um, so if we doubled the voltage, but we use the same gains, suddenly the, the, the motor would not be tuned as well. So what we would like to do is make this a little bit more specific. Um, if the voltage changed, um, if the load changed, um, we'll be, we can adapt a little bit better if instead of directly controlling the PWM from the output of this PID motion controller, this created a desired torque that goes through the motor. So what that says is uh, maybe I'm at this position, but I'm supposed to be at this position. And I happen to know the load. Um, I know the inertia of the bar that I'm trying to rotate. So, and I also know how, how fast should I get there? Uh, how long should it take? So I know the acceleration that I need to apply to this inertia to make it move to the final position I would like it to move to. Um, the further away I am, probably the more acceleration I need. Well, the acceleration of the motor is tied to the torque. The torque is tied to the uh, current. So when I say a desired torque, I really mean I have a desired current that I want to go through the motor. So that will go into um, another PID. In this case, we could probably just do PI um, because it's uh, now it's a first order system. Uh, but we'll do a PI control of the current through the motor. Uh, that must mean that I have a measured an actual or a measured current that's in the motor at that particular moment. So the output of this uh, PI controller is going to be a PWM and a direction pin. Because if I need negative current, I probably need to flip the direction. Um, that will go to my H-bridge. And the H-bridge, of course, has its voltage and ground and all that kind of stuff. Um, the H-bridge output, uh, two outputs go to my motor. Um, that there's current going out of the H bridge through the motor and back. So I'll have a current sensor usually it's in series with the motor electrically. That will produce a voltage um, that is my actual current and my microcontroller will read that voltage uh, interpret it through a calibration equation to know what the current is based on the voltage um, and the uh, controller will control that amount of current. That will make the motor spin. When the motor spins, it moves. My encoder will read the position of the motor and go back into the motion controller. Uh, we didn't talk very specifically about the um, 
uh, how the motor uh, can accelerate. What does it mean for the motor to accelerate uh, based on both the current and the voltage? So the uh, current is able to change with the electrical time constant of the motor. That's related to the resistance and inductance. And typically it's very fast. So if you were to change the voltage on the motor, the current could change very rapidly. So we will do this at a pretty high rate. Um, we'll do something like five kilohertz control on the current through the motor because it's able to change that fast. But the position of the motor um, can't really change that fast. When you change the torque applied to the motor, there's so much more inertia in the motor and the load that we're trying to rotate compared to the amount of torque available that we don't need to read the encoder 5,000 times a second. It just doesn't move fast enough to bother reading that fast. So instead, we'll do something like 500 hertz or maybe 200 hertz um, uh, control here. So 200 times a second, we'll read the position of the motor, compare it to the trajectory, create a desired torque. Um, now, when we uh, output PWM, we'll probably do a fast PWM. We'll do 20 kilohertz PWM. The electrical time constant's filtering out um, that 20 kilohertz uh, wave um, so that it's averaging out the voltage that we're applying uh, using the H-bridge to make current through the motor. So as long as this frequency is faster than the essential low-pass filter that is the RL circuit inside of the motor, um, the uh, PWM frequency will be averaged. So the current controller is going to produce, uh, say, five PWM duty cycles in a row before the current gets sampled again and then outputs a new PWM to try to control the amount of current going through the motor. And then um, 200 times a second, we'll read the position of the motor and figure out if we're in the right position and change the desired torque to if we move too far, move us back, or if we're at the right spot, we'll have zero torque so we stop moving, um, or if we're not still too far away, add positive torque. So it's all, it all boils down to time constants, electrical time constant and mechanical time constant. Uh, your next question should be, how do I know what is the position of the motor? How does the encoder work? And um, how does the current sensor work? Then everything else I think you know. We can use serial communication to uh, send the desired trajectory uh, from MATLAB or Python to the NU32. The NU32 with uh, three different timers now, a 20 kilohertz p timer for PWM, five kilohertz timer for an ISR controlling current, and 200 hertz timer for uh, the position control ISR. So we'll have two ISRs, three timers, We'll have a lot of peripherals. We'll have PWM, we'll have IO, we'll have analog input, uh, we'll have whatever the encoder does. Um, so this is a this is a pretty big project in the textbook. Breaks it up into uh, small little steps, and you can test after every step. Now, one of the first ones is going to be read the encoder on the motor. So what is an encoder? You'll notice on the back of your motor. Uh, I don't think you can see it on the camera, but there's a glass. And in this case, actually a plastic disc on the back of the motor. So here's the motor over here, an output shaft. The shaft goes all out the back and um, on the back of the motor um, is this plastic disc and it has very fine lines drawn on it. We call those the encoder ticks. Um, on one side of the disc is an LED and on the other is some kind of photodiode or phototransistor. So this would be the LED side, and this would be the sensor side. So light is being uh, pushed through this clear disk. And so the voltage produced by the sensor side, um, when there's no line in the way, would be uh, a high voltage. But then as the motor rotates, one of these lines would block, perfectly block, the LED in the sensor so that the voltage went to zero. Um, so there's typically the photodiode and then some kind of amplifier and little circuit that makes this purely a digital signal. And every time a line goes by, uh, we uh, we get a both a high and a low. So each tick, every line, generates one high and one low. So that's one line and then another line. And so this would be like a, a constant velocity. You get a perfect square wave out. Exactly 45 or some subset of 45 degrees away is another one. So we call the first one channel A and the second one channel B. Uh, and B would do the exact same thing. It would generate a square wave as the motor rotates. 
I draw it a little bit bigger so we can compare the two. I'll just find a new marker. Let's see if I can get through this one. Okay, so when one line goes by, A produces a high and a low. B also produces one high and low with that line, but um, that line uh, is out of phase, perfectly out of phase. So as uh, that uh, second line goes by, it's there and then there. Um, what we can do is we can compare the voltages. So um, here's a zero and a one. Here's a, oh sorry, this is a one and a zero. This is a one and a one. This is a uh, zero and a one, and this is a zero and a zero. So one line on the encoder produced four different states between the two sensors. So we get times four resolution due to this. This is called quadrature. Quadrature encoding which means on the other side of things, on the pick side, we'll have to do quadrature decoding. Uh, this can be a little tricky. Every time A goes from um, high to low or from low to high, we would read B and know that um, if A goes from high to low and uh, B is a one, then we should be considering that, the move, the, that we're going that way. If A uh, goes from low to high, and B is high, then we know that uh, the motor is going that way. And we could do that, we could do an interrupt that's based on high and low and low and high for each of these signals. When we get an interrupt, figure out, uh, let's see, if this interrupts and A is high, that means we're at one, we used to be at zero, it's a rising edge. We'll also read B, if this was a rising edge and B is at one, we're going left. Add one to our encoder position. Um, and so forth for all these different interrupts, po interrupt possibilities. That's just a lot of interrupts to, to uh, go through. So what we do is we have the quadrature not go directly to the pick because the pick would be overwhelmed with interrupts to deal with which way is the motor going. Instead, we're going into a DS pick or breakout board that came with your NU32 kit. The DS pick is a uh, PIC33 series. It's a 16-bit pick, but specifically with peripherals for motor control. And it has the ability to count these pulses and know the position of the motor directly. The NU32 then communicates with the DS pick to get the motor position. So that's this branch here, the encoder decoder positioning, reading the quadrature via the DS pick, four times encoding, means that if your encoder had 100 lines, the number of uh, counts per revolution of the motor would be 400. Our motor this year, uh, in 2021 has 334 lines or ticks. Um, so in one revolution, you would get four times 334 counts. The DS pick stores that number as a 16-bit unsigned int. Um, when it first turns on, it stores the number. So that's a number between 0 and 65535. So when it first turns on, it tells you exactly half of 65535, um, and then it counts up and down from there. Okay, so that was figuring out the position of the motor. Uh, the motor has an encoder on the back. Uh, we use four times quadrature decoding to get that number into the pick. Um, we also need to be able to read the current. So how do you read the current uh, in anything? Well, uh, you can put your multimeter in series with the device. So the current that goes through the thing you're trying to read goes through the multimeter, and then the multimeter tells you a number. How does the, how does the multimeter read current, right? Because the pick can only read voltage. So somehow we have to turn the current through something into a voltage. Well, just like the multimeter, what we're doing is we're putting a tiny resistor in series with the device, and then we have an op amp amplifier take the voltage across that resistor and multiply it by a big number to produce a voltage. And then we can back calculate what the current is based on the gain of the op amp. So we'll have um, O1 and O2. Those are the outputs of the H bridge. Um, it will go to the motor. So O1 will go high, O2 will go low. So the current tries to go through the motor. We'll put a little resistor in series, RS plus and RS minus, onto a breakout board 
for the uh, was it the Max nine nine one eight breakout board that came with your NU thirty two kit. So there are three special special boards you got with the NU thirty two kit to do the motor project: the DRV eight eight three five H bridge, the DS pick encoder decoder board, and the Max nine nine one eight current sensor. So here's the, the current sensor has two pins, RS plus and RS minus, and on the Max 9918 board is pre-soldered a 0 0.015 or five uh, or 15 um, milli ohms resistor. That's a very tiny resistor. That way, if there's one amp going through the motor, there's also one amp going through this resistor, there would be um, 15 millivolts across that resistor. So you're going to lose 15 millivolts that used to be across the motor, powering the motor, um, but that's so small compared to the overall voltage applied to the motor by the H-bridge that you don't really lose anything. Then the MAX9918 uh, is a type of op-amp that can amplify that as a V-out um, with some kind of gain. So the current times 0 0.015 times the gain of the op-amp is equal to the V-out. So we would read V-out with uh, in within our uh, current control ISR. There are a bunch of resistors associated with this uh, chip to make the gain. Uh, so there's R1, and then R2, and then R3. Two R3s. Um, so the goal here is, um, here's the feedback pin. The output pin and the ref in pin. We're, we have the ability to send current through our motor both positive and negative directions. Um, if the op amp was referenced to ground, that would try to make a positive output for positive current and negative voltage output for negative current. But the pick can only read positive currents. So we need to bias the op amp chip so that when the current is zero, so when I is zero, this V out would be 1.65 volts, half of the range between zero and 3.3. Then if the current goes positive, this voltage will go up from 1.65 towards three. If the current is negative, meaning that it's going in the other direction, the voltage will go down from 1.65 towards zero. So if you were to read zero voltage, that would actually mean you have the maximum negative current going through the motor. And if you were to read 3.3 volts, that would be the maximum positive current going through the motor. And a voltage of 1.65 on the output means no current through the motor. So R3s are equal. They produce 1.65 volts. And then um, R1 plus R2 divided by R2, that would be the overall gain. Uh, depending on the resistance of the motor, you would choose the gain so that the V out was hitting 3.3 volts just as you got twice the stall current going through the motor, or uh, zero volts when you got twice the negative stall current to the motor. So we could forget about the negative side, just think, um, we need a change of 1.65 volts, so from 1.65 to 3.3 volts when um, there is twice the stall current through the motor. And to know the stall current, you'd have to measure the resistance of the motor. We'll talk about that in a second. But let's say that the gain is something like 100. So we would need, say, 100K. Can you see that? R1 would be 100K, and R2 would be 1K for a gain of 100. What resistors should you use for R3? Well, this is one of those low Z feeds, high Z impedance problems. Um, if these two resistors are feeding R2, they need to be lower resistance than R2. So that would make the R3s something like 100 ohms. So 100 ohms for R3s to make 1.65 volts. That references um, 1.65 when there's no current. Uh, this resistor has to be 10 times bigger than these, and then this needs to be 100 bigger than that for the gain of 100. So that's why we're picking hundreds of ohms for R3, thousands for R2, and um, 10 or hundreds of thousands for R1. Okay, the last re thing we talked about. Um, what should the gain be? The worst possible situation we can be in is that the motor's going full speed in one direction, and then we change the direction pin on each bridge so it goes full speed the opposite direction. That means that we can have twice the stall current on the motor. So if the motor were not moving, we were holding it in one, one um, locking it so it couldn't move, and you apply the voltage to the motor, you get the stall current. But if you're spinning in the full speed, the maximum speed, the no load speed, 
uh, in one direction, and then you told it to go in the other direction, that's how you could possibly get uh, twice the stall current. So the worst case we can ever get uh, current going through the motor would be the stall current. So if we can figure out twice the stall current, if we can figure out the stall current on the motor, we can double it, and that would then tell us what our gain should be. To figure out the stall current, we need to be able to know the resistance of the motor and the voltage of the battery. Okay, you're gonna have uh, four AA batteries for your power supply. A AA battery should be 1.5 volts, but a fully charged brand new AA battery is more like 1.8, and a dead battery is more like 1.3. And the voltage curve kind of looks like that, where it's initially 1.8, drops pretty quickly in the life of the battery, hovers around 1.5 for a while, and then it starts to decay. So you can just basically assume that your battery pack is 6 volts, but it's actually, when it's brand new and fresh, uh, more like 6.5 volts. Um, then you want to figure out what's the resistance of your motor. You have two ways to read resistance. One is to take your multimeter, put it in resistance mode, read across the terminals of the motor, M1 and M2. It's going to be small. It's going to be like, well, less than 10 ohms, um, because these are relatively you know, high torque motors. Um, and it's really, there's only wire in there. And so unless there's miles and miles of wire in those coils, uh, it's like reading the volt, reading the resistance across a piece of wire. Um, even, even, a you know, an okay multimeter like this, or if you've got the little yellow one, the not very okay. Um, if you were to turn on your multimeter and go into voltage mode and just read across the terminals. So this is reading the, the, uh, resistance of the wires in my multimeter here. That's pretty good. This one actually goes down to zero. Um, the, the little yellow ones, they'll probably tell you three or four ohms because the wires that they're made of um, are pretty thin. Um, so these devices aren't really made to measure very small resistances very accurately. They're, they're made to measure you know, in the thousands of ohms accurately. Um, because the motor is such a small resistance, this won't do a very good job for that reason. Also, the brushes are touching the commutator, and depending on the angle of the motor, sometimes you'll read one coil, sometimes you'll read two. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of dust or oxide on the brushes or the commutator. Um, when the motor is spinning or heating up, the, that resistance, that contact resistance will go way down. But when it's just not moving and staying there and it's cool, uh, that resistance will be high. So if you just read the the across the motor terminals with your multimeter, you'll probably get an artificially large number and you can spin it and you'll see that it goes up and down. It can go up to like 60 ohms, it'll go down to like 10 ohms. So that's a rough approximation, but it's an over approximation of the voltage. Um, you'll get more current than you think you will if you just use that method. The better method to use to read the resistance of the motor would be to put a voltage across the motor and stall the motor so it can't move. Now the motor behaves like V equals IR. Uh, so then you would read the voltage because the voltage on the battery might be 1.8 volts each when there's no current going out, but when there's a lot of current going out, it might dip. So you read the voltage across the motor. Then you would um, break open the circuit, put your multimeter in current mode, read the current through the motor with the multimeter, and then you could do V equals IR because you had read the voltage before it stall, then you're reading the current, it stall, divide, um, and for the particular motor you're using this year, I got around six ohms using that method. Much more reliable than just using the resistance uh, setting on your multimeter. Last thing to note, your multimeter has two, sometimes it has two holes or sometimes it has uh, one hole for voltage and current and another for 10 amps. Uh, the 10 amp setting on your multimeter is a little dangerous because that means there's usually no fuse in here. You can read up to 10 amps. If you go over 10 amps, you'll burn out your multimeter. But on the lower scale current setting on your multimeter, there's usually a 200 milliamp fuse. Your motor is going to stall at much higher than 200 milliamps. So if you put your multimeter in the milliamp range of current setting and you leave it in the default hole for milliamps, you will burn out that fuse. And I just assume that every multimeter I ever touch, the, the milliamp fuse is burned out because it's so easy to accidentally touch power and ground with the power setting and the 10 milliamp or 100 milliamp setting, blows out that fuse. Um, that definitely use the 10 amp setting when you're trying to do this kind of experiment. And that's like, this is all the, the whole point of using a current sensor here. Um, it's usually a lot more reliable to use an actual current sensor and read a voltage and back calculate what the current was than to try to use a multimeter. That's not very accurate in the 10 amp setting to get fine resolution of current. Um, and it usually, you usually bend out, burn out whatever um, fuses are built into your multimeter. Okay. So, 
take caution when reading current with your multimeter because it's easy to burn out that fuse. Um, another thing that you'll be doing is you'll be calibrating this uh, current sensor using a power resistor. The power resistor is a very big physical resistor, but a very low resistance. They're big and red, they're 20 ohms each. So you can, um, instead of the motor, you can put your power resistors here instead of the um, H bridge, you can just put power and ground, that'll put current this way. You can read the voltage and the output, and uh, you, you'll know the current going through here because you could read the voltage across the resistor, or you could read the current with your multimeter. You could read this voltage with the pick, back calculate uh, the uh, voltage you read here based on the resistance, get that equation so that later when you put the motor back in, you can read this voltage to get the current through the motor. Okay, in the remaining videos, I'm going to uh, build up the circuit that the assignment requires and show you some of the tricks for uh, reading the data that comes back to, to MATLAB or Python, um, how to set up all these peripherals, and what the graphs should look like uh, as an example. The gains that you choose, the voltage that you have, your specific motor are are all very uh, highly variable, just like we saw in the data sheet for the motor in uh, Jameco. Um, everything is so variable that you won't see the results that I get, and you might you might get better results, you might get worse. Um, if I were to sneak up to nine volts instead of six volts on my battery, I'd get totally different results. I'd probably have totally different gains. So when you're watching those videos, just take them as hints and examples. Don't try to match the exact curve that I get. Um, if you're tuning your gains, don't spend more than 20 minutes tuning gains. Uh, you'll find good gains soon. Good is good enough. You don't have to get great gains. You'll drive yourself crazy trying to get perfect gains.